screen. So sorry. I had a brief technical issue overcoming the barriers. I say, and one more thing here. Participants. Okay. So I'm just getting reset up. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, my name is Elisheva, and I thank you so much for joining us tonight. So I uh, undertook a massive uh, yeah, topic. And um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, two things I wanted to discuss. One, the big one is I'm getting into some really technical Kabbalistic ideas and I'm trying to refrain from using those, those Kabbalistic terms and trying to explain the concepts or ideas or use words that might be more familiar with people. The other part is it's not, this is, this is like an overview of an overview. It's, it's a very uh, broad subject and there's a lot of different bunny trails that you can go down different ideas and different concepts that really deserve to be expounded upon. Um, but I'm trying to focus it on just one idea and concept and that's to bring it to a few points. So um, what we do plan on doing is I have several breaks that are, are written in. I spent a lot more time on what I'm going to discuss than the uh, slideshow, the, um, the slides. So they're a little more low tech than usual. Um, and as always, uh, here, if I get the chat, um, you're welcome to raise your your hand in the room, um, or please type in chat as well um, for questions, clarifications, comments, those type of things. Again, if I didn't greet you uh, individually when you came to the room, I thank you so much for joining us tonight. And this is the third room in a discussion about like, suffering. And um, so let's see here. I'm trying to. Um, there we go. So to begin, um, what I want to start with is this idea of, let me go back a little bit, of Simsum, this idea of constriction, the Kabbalah of Simsum and revealing our path back to God. So there's a very deep idea, one that I really, um, is quite interesting to me, is that without um, concealment, there's truly no way to know God. So through concealment comes revelation. So this idea of contraction and concealment, that is them. So okay. there'll be some breaks as well. So as, as we discussed in previous classes, uh, God's true essence is fundamentally unknowable to us. I mean, the concept of the Ein Sof or the um, absolute nothingness, there is undifferentiated infinite energy. And as finite beings, uh, where the state really is beyond our capacity to understand and even to comprehend, we know it must exist because we believe that there's a creator, there's something that exists beyond us. And the I heard one rabbi say that the existence of the finite energy kind of uh, points to some infinite source. So for the finite to relate to the infinite, there really has to be an interface or a mechanism of limitation and differentiation where that information coming from the infinite is transmitted to the finite. So logically this process by necessity begins with an act of creating differentiation within the system. I'm oh, sorry. Through concealment comes um, revelation or understanding. So logically this process by necessity begins with an act of creating differentiation within this undifferentiated Ain so meaning the process, this, in this process, how does this happen? How does this infinite, unknowable, um, completely united energy become knowable to us? And how is how does this presence of this energy, we can't comprehend or connect with infinite concepts. We might be able to do a thought experiment to understand how they begin, but they're in essence unknowable. So there's the Kabbalists, which we talked about in previous classes, is known as the Arizal. And he describes the creation of differentiation as this process called simsum or concealment. And um, this is the process of divine self-contraction, self-limitation, which makes possible the concept of a limited finite existence. And it's interesting is to say that, you know, God is infinite, but he also contains finite aspects to say that God can't be contained within finite space would be to limit God and therefore take away his infinite reality. Interesting. So this creation of this is a creation of the of, yeah, ex nilio, the idea of I always slaughter that word, by the way, uh, somethingness from nothingness. The Simpson or that first concealment or contraction 
really represents the ultimate and most dramatic change within creation and any other further concealment that act, happens after that of God's light or his or um, are only echoes of that first concealment. As discussed previously, if God's essence were contained, um, I cut out his here. So, so um, how does God create our, our reality? Well, the first is to create differentiation within this all nothingness, within this complete unity. And that would be to create a space for otherness. And we discussed this idea that um, in this consumer, this contracted space with void, as you would call it, um, there has to be God's essence in this, and it can be can be a difficult concept to understand that if God's essence were actually, so this, let me go back, in this void, in this in this space, in this halal, as it's called, in this vacated area, does God's, is God's presence truly there or is it not? And the idea is if God's essence were contained within the space, his infinite light, then this space would not truly be vacated. There would be nothing else besides God's infinite light. It's infinite. Therefore, God's infinite essence would fill the space. There would be no place whatsoever for any other creation or including our own. But the truth is, however, that God's essence still must be within this space uh, because we exist and God creates us from his nothingness, from his eye comes our somethingness. So the truth is God's essence must nevertheless be within this space. And this idea, this concept is called the trace or residue that God, of God's presence, which remains within this vacated space or void called the Rishimu. So this Rishimu or this um, residual trace creates the possibility of otherness and structure. It actually first is the first otherness. It is from this first otherness that all of the structure of our spiritual worlds, um, the Sephirotic system, if you're familiar with Kabbalah, even our physical world is ultimately derived from the Rishemu. And just the, the analogy for me, the best way I understand this is that just as the body of Adam is created first, so too is Rishemu made first. So his body's created, the soul is created, and then they're joined together. So though Adam isn't called a living being when his body is made until God breathes the soul of life into him, the Rishemu also has to be enlivened. It's almost, it's barely existence. It's not dark, but it's almost... Um, it's, it's like I said, it's like the residual after effect after the light is, is withdrawn. So Adam's body was created as a container for the soul in the Rishemu or this residual light is created as a container or the structure for God's light as well. As stated before, the light of the Orient Sof, this infinite light that um, exists before this, the contraction, the symptom um, is, is absolutely unified, undifferentiated, and unknowable. And um, for the system of the Rishema, for this structure, for this void to be filled back with God's undifferentiated light would completely overwhelm the system. Therefore, when the soul of Adam is joined with his body, he becomes a living being. When the, the structure of the Rishema, this, this, this halal, this void, is enlivened with God's infinite light, there has to be some kind of um, holding back. Said if, if that if the undifferentiated light of God's orange self, his undifferentiated energy was reintroduced back into the system, it would immediately um, revert this entire vacated space back to infinite. And therefore would completely undo the whole purpose of the initial contraction or concealment. Therefore, the, the symptom or the concealment, which creates this vacated space and the possibility of otherness, also acts as a mechanism of restriction of God's infinite light or his orient self. And the Kabbalists describe this action as a thin channel of restricted light that makes it into this halal or vacated space. And this is known as the Kav. And it's able to bring in, enliven, or shame it without overwhelming the system, reverting everything back to infinite, undifferentiated nothingness and um, allows for this enlivening of the system. So the light that flows, and I know this is a lot of information at first and I'll definitely answer questions, but the light that, that comes to this channel is drawn from the orange soap. 
So the the um, unlike the Rishemu, this this residual light that exists within this contracted space, which is something completely new. It's an otherness. Before there was nothingness, now there's somethingness, the ein and the ish, as it's called in Kabbalah. Um, the the orient self, the cob, the light of the cob is not a new thing. It's it's not an otherness in itself. It's light that flows in from the infinite aspect of God. Therefore, you can liken the relationship of the cob, which is the 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 thin light that flows into this vacated space, to the reshemu. It's similar to that of the body and the soul. So the orient self is the infinite aspect of God. So God, God's undifferentiated light really cannot interact with our finite reality, as I stated a few times before. So thus the Rishema creates this interface or it creates the possibility for this interface to exist where this light is limited and restricted so that the energy of this undifferentiated um, infinite aspect of God can interact with the physical world. It can be transmitted, it can be understood, it can be known, God can be known. So our soul requires a body to interact with the physical world. So too does God's light or his or need a structure to interface with the finite. Without that, God would may, remain unknowable. And without the light to flow into this, this completely concealed space, it would just be its own world. There'd be nothingness there inside as well. There has to be this interaction between the two. That information has to be, that structure has to be brought alive, just like the body has to be brought alive by the soul. So this interesting is the is the reshemu or this after the residual light that remains after this um, after the concealment. It has it's reflected. It's similar to the orange self, but it's of an intermediate stage. So before the light that flows into the cob enters into this vacated space, this reshemu or residual light, just like the light of the orange self, is undifferentiated and with the introduction of the light of the, through the Kav and the flow of light into the Rishemu, the structures within the space can become revealed. And it's a silly analogy, but it's one way that I think of it is, um, it sounds interesting that, that this revelation of God comes through the initial concealment. And I think of it like, I don't know if, um, I can't even remember the movie. Is this uh, invisible man is causing a lot of issues, and um, and and somebody figures out that there's somebody who has this capacity to, um, he's invisible. He still has a physical body, but it's unseeable to everyone. So he basically throws a sheet over it, and by concealing this, you know, by covering the invisible man, he now takes form, he takes shape, and the just you know he can see it's just a person. He has a nose, he has a mouth. You can see the form and function of a person underneath the sheet, and you're able to identify what's been causing all the problems. So by concealing and lessening and lowering this light and by shining energy back in that, that now form and structure and differentiation can take place within this vacated space. But as we said, the, the Rishemu maintains, a, a, it's a lower light in that it, it still, but it still retains the aspects of that infinite orient self. It's still an undifferentiated light in itself. It's only after the introduction of the Kav and the flow of the light into the Rishemu can these structures contained within this space be revealed. There's no deficiency within God. The Rishemu is a reflection of God's perfection as well, and therefore it doesn't have any deficiency or um, differentiation at this point. So the question is, how can differentiated be created, differentiation be introduced and created within the system? So the development and the differentiation of within the system is known as the shattering of the vessels. So differentiation meaning ein, uh, nothingness to somethingness prior to this process is called simsum, contraction or concealment. Within the system itself though, the differentiation and distinction of this reshema or this light is known as the shattering of the vessels. So the first primordial structures, let's see here. So the first primordial structures or vessels made within this um, contracted space, they were made to contain God's light, were created with a primary and a secondary purpose. So the primary 
purpose of these vessels is obviously to hold God's light, they're vessels, but they have a secondary function as well. And this is a very important one. And this secondary function is to bring about a state of separation or partition of the light into distinct qualities and attributes and thereby introduce diversity and multiplicity into the system. Just as the Simpson makes a distinction between nothingness and somethingness, the Simpson does this, the shattering of the vessels create further distinction and diversity within, within the um, constricted space. So their, really their primary focus, for purpose, I'm sorry, their primary purpose was to contain the light and their secondary purpose is to shatter. And they fulfill this by breaking, causing this diversity and differentiation within the vacated space. So this deficiency or differentiation to become a reality what are you doing? for us, for this, this, there has to be a breaking of the good contained within the primordial vessels, which shatters and falls, it gets lowered. Shattering of the vessels served a very important function. This allows the possibility of evil. It creates further distance between perfection and imperfection. The vessels serve to allow for the possibility of evil. They give man the opportunity to choose good for he, which he gained reward and evil for which he is punished. God's attributes of loving and kindness and judgment are also revealed in this action. And these are the attributes which are the roots of reward and punishment. So further knowledge, further um, Mido, further characteristics and attributes of God are revealed through the shattering and this concealment. And this is the primary purpose of creation is to reveal God's attributes to mankind, to create mankind. So better understand this concept, we're gonna ex explore the creation of mankind. I'm gonna allow some, oh, this is some, some somebody with a good sense of humor made this. So I know I've gotten into, and it might be difficult to follow this. And I'm hoping that in the next section, we'll be able to um, kind of bring it all together when we talk about Adam, the creation of Adam and Eve and how this mechanism plays out in, um, in the account in Genesis. Any questions so far? <laughs> I know there must be a few. So this is the question, how can there be a void if Hashem is om omnipresent? And this is the thing that these ideas of God is, um, the finite is contained within the infinite, meaning that God has the capacity to create finite space as much as he has the capacity to be in his essence a finite being. And this is the point where we have to say, there are aspects of this that we don't quite understand, but we know must be true because we exist. We as created beings can contemplate things beyond our own reality, but we may not truly be able to comprehend them. And this is why this idea of infinite existence is the unknowable aspect of God, this unknowable reality that God exists in that we cannot even comprehend, yet we know must exist because we're here and we're questioning that. So would you so, so um, we are not God, no, we are not God though we are made by God and we contain, um, we can be, our souls are, and even the physicality of our body and our world extends from God's infinite light. So are we, so would you say that these ideas are a way to answer not only creation, but the problem of evil and divine hiddenness that philosophers try to solve? Absolutely. This is the whole idea of the Arizal talking about this. How does, how does a finite creation come from an infinite unknowable aspect of reality, which we call God. And this answers these questions. And it's the beginning of, uh, in, in, in these ideas as we introduce them, hopefully you'll see how they play out. Um, the idea is that God is perfect. He is infinite, he is unknowable. So this entire unfolding of creation, the process from the infinite becoming down to, coming down to the finite existence of our own self, this unfolding of creation answers these really deep questions. Where is God in creation? Why is he hidden? How does evil come about? Why does evil have a part in my life? Why do people suffer? Where is God when he suffer? These ideas are answered at a really high level. In previous classes, we taught, you know, I talked about your individual circumstances, why a particular event happens to you as an individual. That 
is the level of prophecy. That is a level of understanding that even Moshe himself couldn't have. You know, he asked, um, he was shown, I don't know if you're familiar with the account of Rabbi Akiva. Um, so there's an account where um, basically as God is, 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 Moshe is ascending Mount Sinai to receive the commandments. Um, he's, he's shown, he's given, a, he's shown an image of, of, um, of somebody in the future who will teach his Torah and that's Rabbi Akiva. And there's great merit, Rabbi Akiva's teaching and his actions cause great merit. And, um, and, and Moshe asked, what is his reward? And he sees that uh, Rabbi Akiva in the future will, will come to a really horrible end. And basically the question, the obvious question in this account is why? Why does, why does such a great man, such a, you know, such a, uh, a Zadik, a righteous individual who, who, who teaches Torah and, and connects people to God, why does he come to such an end? And this is the unknowable question that the, those particular events, that idea of what actually um, the why behind a lot of actions in the individual basis may not be able, to, you may not be able to find an answer for, it, but there is a higher purpose, there's a higher function, and there all of these actions have uh, connect back to really, really fundamental um, events that transpire um, within the creation of our, our world. I don't know if that answers the question. Hopefully, as I go on, I'll be able to um, bring some more light to that. Yeah. Um, and there's a few articles and a few places that definitely will, will, will send people to look. I've been kind of quiet in the in the forum because I've been um, working and uh, going to school full time. So God willing, um, after May 7th, I'll be able to put a lot more time and energy into bringing about more um, about more information. Anita had a question. Okay, let's see if I can go back. How does the concept of time affect this or is it a different concept? So the concept of time, cause and effect, I mean, you can say that time, has a play and that is the first cause of from nothingness to somethingness, but really it's a different, a different topic to be covered later. And then what was the other questions there? Yeah. So was there other questions, Tovia, after hers? Let's see here. Thought the other side came from. Well, that's a different. That's the that that aspect and evil are two different topics. Is making something from nothing from something something from nothing a divine thing? It's a divine thing. Yeah. It's a divine, a divine idea. So if we want to get a quick drink, I'm going to do that myself. And then we'll take a longer break in a moment. So in regards to Adam and Eve, and hopefully, and I'm bringing these really, and, and, and again, these, like, these ideas that I'm discussing and just barely, barely not even touching upon, there are literally volumes and volumes of information, books written and teach hours, thousands of hours of teachings on these very concepts and ideas. So just introducing these ideas in a way that um, we have, we're limited by time, but hopefully introducing these ideas and bringing them down to a level that might be a little more comprehensible to people and myself, this is how I understand them. So as discussed previously, um, in other classes, uh, the ultimate purpose of creation is, is the creation of mankind, for man to come into existence. So the entire process of creation is to endow mankind with a sense of self or separateness that is unique in creation. If we don't have a sense of yesh, we don't have a sense of otherness, and we only are considered, you know, we only are connected to God and we're part of this, this absolute unity, then we'll never be able to, to um, know God. We need a perspective from which to see God and comprehend God. And this is the structure that's put in place by the Rishemu, which creates this interface where information is limited and we can comprehend God. And this ultimately comes down into to the creation of the Garden of Eden, mankind. This sense of otherness, which we're given, the sense of self, it really exists because we're made in the likeness of our creator. God is, God is, has a, comprehension of his own being. Therefore, we must have a comprehension of our own being or a sense of separation and self and, and, and yesh. So our function then 
is to take and reflect back to Hashem, this holy image, and create a dwelling place for Hashem, our God, in our world. That's how we use this otherness and this separate sense of self. So the wrong call talking about Adam and Eve before the fall, before they're in the state, um, the state of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is one of near perfection. So meaning that God's presence in creation was concealed only to the extent necessary for a creation to exist. Therefore, Adam and Eve's reality is far, excuse, far different than what we experience in our present world. And this is revealed most poignantly in the curses that follow when they're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that, that account. And so you can see that they had an access and a knowledge of God. Sorry, one moment. Oops, sorry. One call. Um, so they had an access to the knowledge of God that we don't, we don't, we don't have today. They had uh, a knowledge and 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 a un there was a there was a greater unity and a greater um, oneness in the Garden of Eden than we experience today. So. Therefore, Adam and Eve, okay, so the, this this is revealed most poignantly in the curses. We can see the differences when 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 they eat of the tree and they're ultimately um, expelled from the garden and these curses are given, are played, are, are spoken. You can see the the difference between Adam and Eve before they eat of the knowledge of the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One moment. And after the world substantially changes, it fundamentally changes. So I'll leave these up while I read a little bit more. So the curses reveal a fundamental shift in the nature of our, of creation. If Adam had not sinned, then we can see the opposite of a lot of these curses would be true. The entire world would have reached a final state of perfection. Um, evil would not have, would have served its function and ceased to exist. And mankind would have achieved spiritual and physical perfection. So rather, at the moment, Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, evil, which had been an external force, and I'm going in a lot of topics without even introducing them, so my apologies, kind of fast forwarding through to the next point. Evil, which had been an external force, meaning it wasn't integrated into, into, the, into Adam's being. It became an intrinsic part of his being and, and, and his very essence becomes now filled with contradictions. Um, the wrong call describes evil basically as a vehicle. You know, you, you, the vehicle is a tool, it's not part of you, it's external to you. And so, therefore, that was evil before he ate of the tree. So the radiance of his soul, the presence of God, they all become concealed, they become hidden. And as a result of this, um, Adam loses access to his previous state. So Rabbi Arya Kaplan in Inner Space, I mean, states, the entire world, as we stated before, was created for Adam, was created for mankind. And when Adam eats from the tree of the knowledge, he brings concealment into creation. He brings the entire world down with him. Um, he can no longer detect God's presence. Adam and Eve are able to hide for the first time or try to from God. And he has to overcome tremendous obstacles to get back to Hashem, to God. So the light, so it says that he had seen Adam's existence prior to um, eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that there was a light that extended from one end of the universe to the other that's hidden. And now um, he doesn't have that revelation and that knowledge and the power that of evil to conceal godliness within our world is greatly enhanced. That's what causes this um, um, difficulty, this, this striving to get back to, it's a barrier now. Instead of being a vehicle and a tool, it becomes a barrier, evil does. So this concealment or klipa, it's a shell or a husk, surrounds the Garden of Eden after his sin. And we see this because the, there's um, the flaming sword and the cherubim, the um, cherubim that, are, that guard the path back to the tree of life and prevent Adam from returning to that. So this concealment of godliness is also manifested physically within Adam in the um, foreskin. So in Kabbalistic terms, let me see here. Um, we have the Sephiratic tree here. In Kabbalistic terms, this is a Sifra of Yesod, um, the channel through which the world is sustained. And since mankind's actions have a definite effect on the spiritual dimension, um, the divine Yesod now has a covering or barrier as well, meaning that all spiritual sustenance or the Shefa must flow through this dark barrier, Klipa, thus greatly diminishing the light. Additionally, because of Adam's sin, evil can now draw sustenance from the sparks of holiness. So we have this idea, this is why within Judaism, 
circumcision or brit milah is so important and because before that a person exists in this dual state of of um it's uh of both a mixture of of evil meaning the drawing back to the fall of, of Adam and the foreskin, when removal of that, then you go back to its, his pure state before eating of the tree. So there's a great deal more information we could definitely go into regarding a lot of these ideas. These topics are much, much more extensive than time here allows. Um, but to continue, um, this process uh, is a counterpart to something that we discussed a little bit earlier, the shattering of the vessels. So the effect of the eating of the tree causes a greater division and distinction within creation. Also, the Ram Paul says physicality. The effect um, is that there's concepts and ideas which had previously been unknowable to unknown to Adam now become known. Um, just as the holiness of these primordial vessels are shattered and they fall into concealment, they just like um, they have the capacity to uh, be sustained by the by the by evil as well. They're they they're, they're good energy of these, the holy light, the good that was contained within these vessels shatters and falls. And this energy that was meant to be part of this unified structure to elevate mankind now feeds this dark energy, the evil. Evil can just be sustained from this due to these sparks that fall. So the new reality as a result of all of these things is that Adam faces um, realities that he never had to face before. Suffering, animosity, death, and as God is truly good, and we've discussed this in, I think, the first and second class, um, all of these curses, all of these mechanisms of um, concealment and, and division ultimately must be for good itself. And, um, and even death itself is ultimately a mechanism of repair. Okay. So it is entropy. I was going to use that term, Francisco, and I wasn't sure I, if. I, I, I uh, yeah, so this idea of the curse in the garden is like, it, it does, information is lost when the, um, when the, uh, when the vessels shatter and fall. This is what concealment do is. Um, and what shattered the Sephirot, these primordial worlds, we're going to get into that. It's a really, really great question. So what I think I will do um, is I'll play a moment of music, give everyone a little bit of a break, and um, be back in about two minutes. Okay. Um, if you, I'm not sure if I'm muted or not, but um, if people wanted to type questions or raise their hand, um, please do so during the break and I'll hopefully get back to the, to the questions once it begins again. Okay.
unmute. So my apologies, the audio issues that I have seem to be affecting my ability to play music. So, um, and I, like I said, this is just a very broad, very, very, very general overview of these ideas and concepts. So I was really, let me go back and see if I have. So ABC asked a good question. Does a cur is a curse a blessing in disguise? It's a very good question. And you can see that what we call curses, I would say they're describing them more as natural consequences of of God's being concealed in the world. Um, there's a really important principle that I really, I had a difficult time including it in my written text as ideas that if God truly is this infinite um, undifferentiated light and wants to create an otherness, there has to be a buffer between that otherness and, and the infinite um, aspect of God. There has to be a division or a barrier that exists that um, for our otherness to be otherness, for us to have a sense of self, a sense of identity and a sense of separation, there has to be separation between us and God. And therefore, um, God doesn't want to force his presence upon us because we, we know what happens. If God were to force his, his knowledge and his presence on us, that would take away our otherness, our sense of self and our sense of, uh, of, of separation. Therefore, this mechanism, this unfolding of creation causes maximum concealment. And that's what we're gonna be getting into the next session. Um, why, what caused the shattering of the vessels and how does that really impact us as created beings? And let's see here. I'm trying to scroll down here to see, I saw there's a question. So Kabbalistically, there's a purpose for people misunderstanding Torah so much. Christians and Muslims, many of them are devout and sincere in their intention, but it seems based on this explanation, they're not interpreting the text correctly, missing the context. I, I would I would agree, Francisco, um, but you know, in every individual, every circumstance, every person has circumstances where there's a amount of concealment in, in, that they have to overcome as an individual. I think that this, to a, to a lesser, to a greater extent in some religious systems, there's more concealment of God, but that doesn't mean that they're, that the individual isn't truly have a love of God and, and, and trying to connect to their creator. Um, it's just the amount of darkness to overcome to get to the light is different for every person. Um, did I miss any questions? I'm trying to see. So how do the fundamental forces of nature possibly a fifth relate to the concepts of Kabbalah? Um, very awesome question. Um, it's interesting that, um, and a side note, I, I mean, I don't necessarily understand quantum physics or physics that to a great deal in, in general, but a lot of the concepts and a lot of these ideas that are used in this Kabbalistic language from the 11th, 12th and 13th century uncannily describe what quantum physics and physicists would start to understand starting in the, you know, um, in the, in the 1800s down to our present time. And um, so the language of Kabbalah, you can look at it as a religious antiquated idea, but when you, when you compare and contrast it to the ideas of modern physics, especially modern quantum physics, it's uncanny how um, these Kabbalists are describing the creation of the universe from nothingness to somethingness and the unfolding of our world and our physicality. When you look at the Big Bang and, and the effects of the cooling universe and the and, you know in the in the formation of you know of, of subatomic particles and then atoms and then um, you know from helium you know the cooling of the universe and as as uh, matter comes into formation it's just very amazing how how similar um, the explanation of Kabbalah is to the explanation of the creation of the universe according to physics. Um, and again, I'm sorry if I'm missing questions. Um, so I'm gonna get back into the text a bit here. And I didn't create this slideshow. Oh, we had the break. Wait, 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 no, no, no. So we're just gonna stay on this one here. I don't have, a, like I said, I don't have a lot of slides, um, but we're gonna to get to the question that was asked was why did it, what caused the shattering of the vessels? Oh, my, my mic fades in and out periodically. 
Okay, I'm sorry if it does. Like I said, it seemed to have some audio issues. So going back, um, we're talking about how these these curses truly are truly are mechanisms of repair. That God being good, and we've discussed this idea that in these aspects of 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 um, revelation of God's attributes, which we say he, God is good, he's patient, he's loving, kind, he's merciful, that we only see a minute aspect of this, of God's goodness, that there are, that this, the concept of goodness relates back to an infinite being. So therefore the concept of, in, of goodness itself is truly infinite. So when we have these contradictions of this can't be good because it doesn't appear to, to contain the definition of what good is according to us, um, Kabbalah would say it's because our, our view and our perspective is quite limited and we don't see, we can't com comprehend or fathom all the aspects of God's infinite goodness. So the Arizal talks about this idea that these primordial vessels, they exist in a world called tohu or chaos. And you can see that in, in, in Genesis 1-1, the world is tohu, vohu, it's, it's formlessness or chaos and void. So the world existed, this is a world that existed, obviously, if you read in, in, Bereshit, in Genesis, before the world that we know. So um, this primordial world was classified as full of light and few vessels. So we said, the Rishim, at this point, it's not truly differentiated. It's, it has, it's not the, it's not a, a, uh, the uh, Ein Sof, it's the residual light from the Ein Sof, but it reflects qualities of the Ein Sof, and therefore it has a level and a degree of differentiation. It's barely, um, it's barely here. It's like an imprint, and so um, it needs the light of this of the Kaf to bring it into into reality. The two need each other, just like the body and the soul. So the primordial view is that there's this, there's an imbalance in this system, and this was an intentional imbalance created within the Rishim of the Kaf. Um, and this is this imbalance because there's more light and few vessels. Therefore, the vessels aren't able to contain all the light of the Kav, and therefore they shatter, they, they break, because they're not a proper, there wasn't a proper receptacle for this great energy. And as before I stated, this, this shattering, this, this um, lowering of one vessel down, this, this shattering and, and, and um, I almost see the, the, the word that the Ram call uses, which is more of like a chemistry term is precipitation. These things become more solidified and they fall down into the next level. And just as somebody brought up before this entropy information is lost and this information isn't truly lost. It's withheld from the next level. Just like energy can never be neither really be created nor destroyed. This is true in the unfolding of the world. That light is unchanged. It's just um, diminished to the next level. And so what it follows the world of Tohu or this chaos where these primordial vessels existed and shattered. Okay, I think I need to restart. I'm getting text that my audio quality is pretty poor. So what I'm gonna do is um, have, um, I'm gonna take another quick break, restart my machine and hopefully hopefully um, it'll fix the sound issues and my sound will come back better. I'm so sorry. Um, if somebody wants to type some, oh, I'm good now. Okay, let me know. Um, so the result of this imbalance is the shattering of the vessels. There's more light, few vessels able to contain that. And um, following this world of tohu or chaos, God creates this world of tikkun or rectification. Um, so these vessels are shattered, they're broken, they're rebuilt um, into, into a new concept, into a new construct in the world of Kabbalah. These, these shattered remnants of the vessels, these primordial vessels are created into vessels of um, the next route. The, they're, they, they're created into new realities called partufim or, uh, uh, and so this world, the world of Tiku and the world of repair is characterized by less light and more vessels. In other words, it's a balance between the light and the vessels so that the light can be differentiated and contained appropriately. So the interesting thing is as more, as more concealment and energy is held back in the system, the more differentiation and the more um, we can comprehend the various attributes and characteristics of God. Because before that, at that one level of above that, they're undifferentiated, unified, and unknowable. We can't comprehend infinite goodness, but we can un comprehend finite goodness. And so 
um, as this as this energy, as the light of God is being concealed and restricted from one level to the next, thank you, um, we are able to comprehend more aspects of God. So an important, uh, important point to bear in mind here is that as with the shattering of the vessels from the world of chaos, these sparks of light, they become scattered, they're spread, and they're sitting there waiting um, to be refined and through the proper channels. Uh, we can elevate these sparks by finding them um, appropriate vessels of expression. And anytime we take an element or an object in this world, this physical world, and we use it for a mitzvah, for a good deed, we elevate these sparks back to their source. Like you said, God isn't going to pour, he can't pour his infinite light into our world. He's relying on us to bring it down to us, like we said, to serve God and to build a space for him in our world. So you can see the primordial roots of the commandments of kosher, of eating kosher foods, of foods that are clean and unclean. It's where they where they connect in this world. So in describing the process of the vessels, the Arizal uses um, another terminology. He says that when, so you can see that there's 10, we're gonna, there's, um, we're gonna, we're gonna ignore the little guy there in the middle dot. You're gonna look at the, um, the 10 sephirot without dot and see that these lower set, well, okay. So there's upper three and lower seven. They all, they, they, there's a shattering of these lower seven vessels. I wasn't gonna get quite into the Kabbalistic tree, but the maker of this, all the audio is still taking it out. Okay. I think that I might actually try and do that. It's probably an earbud. No, it's not, it's my computer. Um, I'm gonna really do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it one last time. This, this, this last part is really important. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna bow out for a moment, reboot, and God willing, be right back with audio that works correctly and a mic that's not um, having issues. Okay, one moment. Hey all, if you wanna uh, save the questions for a couple minutes till she gets to the end of this last section. So just write them down on a piece of paper or something and then we'll kind of spring them all on her at once at the end, okay? Thanks. And yeah, we're gonna be changing our Saturday night rooms to Thursday nights um, to accommodate people for uh, Shabbat and Abdallah um, for the spring, you know, into the summer months. So we'll probably be doing that in a couple of weeks or so to make the change to Thursday. So we'll, there'll be announcements. Because Thursday works. <laughs> That's how I roll, Benjamin. Absolutely conspiracy. Kind of like Cato in the Green Hornet movies, you know, when she comes home. Not Green Hornet, what am I thinking? Um, Clouseau, Inspector Clouseau, Pink Panther movies, Edo. <laughs> Same time, yeah, probably nine o'clock Eastern on Thursdays, I think we're finalizing that, but we're trying to find a time and day that accommodates the, the people who are running the rooms and as many people as we can to attend, but Saturday's not working because of 
we run into the time problems with Shabbat. So and Thursday is the uh, tentatively the best room, best night. So hopefully we'll see her back in in a minute. She had to reboot her machine and find her way back here. So it should be another minute maybe. Um, we do have room. I have to redo my matrix room because I had to postpone it from the other night. But, so I'm not sure yet. I'll announce that too. Um, and then we'll probably have at least one, maybe two more Saturday night rooms and then switch over to the Thursdays going into um, probably at the end of the month, going into next month. That's my guess. Can anybody hear me now? Okay, I am still having some computer glitches. God willing, I'll be able to overcome them. Okay, someone has a hand raised. Let me see here. I can hear you. Okay, good. Does somebody have the hand raised for a question? We can hear you. Beautiful, thank you. Okay, and I have to share my screen. There we go. Share screen. Share sound. Okay. Thank you so much for your patience. And uh, it's been a definitely a night of technical glitches. It's not a big thing to share the screen. It's just a picture of representation here. Um, so, um, I'm going to go back just a bit and reiterate some of the things I said before I dropped off and.
again, thank you for patience and holding on. So an important point to bear in mind is that with the shattering of the vessels from the world of chaos, these sparks of light are scattered and spread and um, are waiting for us to be refined and through the proper channel and usage. And we can elevate these sparks by finding them the appropriate vessels of expression. So anytime we take an element or an object in this world and use it for a good deed, for a mitzvah, um, we're elevating those sparks. An example in Judaism is uh, if you take and um, you have you eat kosher food and you uh, do a good deed, then you've elevated that animal to a level where it could not go on its own. So in describing the process of the shattering of the vessel, the Arizal states that when the seven lower vessels shattered, they in fact died. That means to say that they descended from one level of existence to a lower level of existence. And if you're and you're thinking in the Kabbalistic four worlds of creation from Atzilut, which is the highest level, down to the next level, Berea. And it is this descent that is their death and their demise. And um, it's a, a future topic I'd really like to get in, uh, do for a class, God willing, would be this idea of where, what the shattering of the vessels and how they relate into the death of the kings. So um, as Zohar explained, something is said to have died when it leaves its true level and descends to a, a lower level of existence. And we know that these vessels, they go from a level of unity and, and um, cohesion down to a level of separation and distinction. And um, so despite the shattering, they're shattering in the descent, the descent, the vessels, these primordial vessels still retain a small amount of holiness and these sparks of the original light accompany them, accompany these shattered vessels as they fall into the world of Berea and lower. And so these world, these, this energy, these vessels in, in the Kabbalistic world are reconstituted into that Sephirotic tree that we see here. Um, and they become two-way vessels where the first vessels, their primary function was to, to, be, to receive. They now become two-way vessels, not only able to receive, but also to transmit. And that was, the, that was the, um, the causing of the shattering of these primordial vessels, that the energy of the, of the cob, the light was so great that they weren't able to contain this. Uh, how do you rectify that? Will you make a vessel that can also transmit as well as receive? So therefore, um, these vessels now are more, um, they, 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 they come closer to the image of, of their creator, which is God. Uh, so these sparks that remain in these lower worlds, these sparks retain just enough spiritual life force to ensure that these broken vessels can be restored and rectified. And that's exactly what happens. And this process is also um, reflected in Adam's sin, going back to some of the consequences of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One of the primary ones that we face every day is death. And so this process um, of the shattering and rectification uh, is reflected through Adam's sin. It causes him to descend from this really beautiful world of existence known as the Garden of Eden to a much lower level of existence, which is our physical world and the world we exist in right now. And he faces a new reality. It's a new aspect of creation that he didn't understand before. And this is the aspect of the reality of death. So the Arizal compares the process of death and resurrection to that of a seed. Um, he explains that just like a seed is buried in the ground, I think we have a seed. Do we have the seed one? We have the seed one. There we are. Uh, buried in the ground, and it appears to rot. I mean, it, it, um, it's actually going um, through a very necessary aspect of transformation. Um, let's see here. To bring forth new life and a new reality. I accidentally co covered my chat, so I'm, I'm missing questions. So Francisco says there seems to be a pattern with death or God and offering to God. Yeah, and, um, and, and, and this is a way to understand the animal sacrifices, which before these concepts, I, I learned these concepts really kind of seemed arbitrary and brutal. And so um, it, this, this is a system that describes and explains what the energy is being, um, how the energy is being created and utilized in that system as well. So... As the Zohar teaches, when a person dies, they're lowered into the ground, they're buried, and this is a specific commandment in the Torah. Uh, there remains a seed to which an aspect of, of the person's soul remains connected and is later used to build the resurrected body. So even though the body seems to decay and disintegrate and go back to dust, as the, as the, as the um, Chumash says, um, there's an aspect that remains connected and in, in Kabbalah, this is called the loose bone, this mystical bone that reconstitutes the body of a person. And this reveals that even the curse of death um, and the disintegration of the body is actually a mechanism of repair 
that's intended to rectify creation and create a new greater reality. So the Ram Call, I should say, the um, Rabbi Arya Kaplan's commentary on the um, on the Ram Call in the book called Derech Hashem or the Way of God, he discusses that the only way for mankind to really rectify the repair, the damage done through the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is really death and and being and having you know com- becoming one with the physicality and reconstituted. So, what does this all mean for us? You know, these ideas are, are obviously you can see these patterns and how they repeat. But the the reality is we owe our very existence. The fact that I can talk to you, you're you, and I'm not you, and I'm me, and you're not me, and I can comprehend God. Um, the fact that this this reality exists is goes down to the very um, our existence is due to the concealment of, of God in the differentiation of his light within creation. And but yeah, it's through this creation of otherness, our sense of self, and the shattering of the vessels and this and this mechanism to give us the power and the capacity to choose and to comprehend a, a, a God, it creates the possibility of evil. Evil comes into existence with the shattering of the vessels, but that also gives us the capacity to choose. And we have all the consequences that come a result of these choices, which brings about further concealment and um, further uh, division, further differentiation, and also causes things like pain, sickness, loneliness, all these negative consequences that come about with the further concealment of God. So as discussed previously, God's true essence truly is good. It's only good. And I and I can go back if and and I can go back in our group and see um, if you have the question that when there seems to be a contradiction of good, that is our limited capacity to understand that. And you can see this in a way, for me, I see it um, in a small way through um, the explanation of, of death and resurrection. So the very process that is necessary for our existence um, creates a secondary reality of evil and that greatly affects us today. Concealment. The reality was meant to give us the sense of otherness and with it free will, the ability to choose and the ability to know and comprehend God. Um, and we see as the order of creation unfolds with each, each successive world, God's light becomes further and further constricted, causing further differentiation of the structures within creation, further distinction and greater concealment. I'll get to your question in a moment. So as the intent of creation is to create an otherness, therefore our reality would necessitate that it contained the greatest amount of concealment possible without cutting it off entirely. So it's only through the concealment of God's presence that we come into existence. So the greater the concealment of God, the greater our sense of otherness and separation. And therefore, um, the true good that God wishes to bestow upon mankind, it only can come and be realized through our world of concealment, a world where you know, where God forbid a person can say God doesn't even exist. God's presence in our world is hidden to such an extent that we have the capacity to deny the very existence of God himself. And we can fill our own existence, not with God's presence as we're supposed to do, but with our own ego, our own yesh, our own sense of self. And you can see the man's capacity to fill himself in this world is, is almost unlimited. You can think of like very evil men that have existed within creation that fundamentally changed the lives of millions of people. Like how can one person in this world affect millions of people? It seems when you really step back from it and think that's pretty amazing that one person's power has the capacity to affect millions, even billions, uh, God forbid. And and that that works both ways. It can also work for the good as well. You think of like Jonas Salk who created the, uh, you know, um, polio vaccine, you know, his, his work and his understanding affects millions of people, millions of people, well beyond his death. So these, this, these are the roots of these kind of ideas and where they stem from. And it goes right back to the very, very first moments of creation itself. Um, so um, God over, so there's this idea uh, as, as someone talked about the Omer count where we go through these different attributes of God and we try to, um, bring about a rectification or a repair, like it talks about when these vessels shattered, they're reconstituted, they're rebuilt into something that is even greater than um, what, what, was, what was shattered and lost. And so um, God is able to overcome his finite being to create a, his, I'm sorry, God is able to overcome his infinite essence, his 
infinite reality, the Ein Sof, to create a finite reality. He's overcome, and this is the attribute of Netzach, if you're doing the count of victory. What is God victorious over? His own, his own undifferentiated unity that he can overcome his true essence to create a reality where our otherness can exist, which is quite a miracle. So um, this world, as a result, to reflect God, um, in this world creates the greatest possibility and sense of otherness possible. So when you look at it from the perspective of Adam and Eve's actions, you can see that they caused exactly what was necessary for us to truly have the goodness of God, to truly know God, is they created such an extent of concealment that God's presence in our world is almost completely wiped out. So, or we should say it's not truly wiped out, the sense of this of God's presence. God is hidden, he's still there. So um, this world creates a greatest possibility of the sense of otherness so that we can reflect back the highest image of our creator by constricting and diminishing our own sense of self, our own otherness. The wrong call states that in the spiritual reality, there's no, there's no physicality. So when you, it says to grow close to God, how do you go close to God? You don't move physically closer to God. That's impossible. There are, so what does it mean to be close to God? It means to resemble our creator, to reflect back his image, to, to rectify his attributes that are contained with us, within us, and like a mirror, reflect back the image of God. So the only way to, how do you do this? Oh, this is a great concept, a great idea, it's, but it's very esoteric. How do you do it practically? How do you reflect back God's image to himself? How is this accomplished? And it's accomplished through keeping the commandments, the study of Torah, prayer, and it's all good deeds, just doing good deeds. Be a mensch. So these are the tools that help us build back a path to our creator. They're mechanisms to repair ourselves, to draw down the light, to bring God's light and essence back into our world, to bring wholeness and completion to these shattered vessels of our world. And um, just as God makes a space for us through the symptom, through this contraction and creates a void for our reality to exist, um, he creates an interface where he is able to limit his essence, his being, so that we can know him. The same interface, the same mechanism, the same order of unfolding of the worlds down to our creation, it becomes a structure for us to climb back to God himself. That is, it's only through us contracting, we, we contract our sense of self when we are able to align our ego and our attributes to be, to reflect the image, to mirror the image of God that um, we're able to affect and create a space for God within ourselves and within the world as well. So to end, we're created with a very unique, every individual has a purpose. We are not created superfluously. Every human being alive was created with a unique role and a function in this world that only you and you alone can fulfill. Nobody else can do what you are here to do and no one else will be created with the same, uh, the same tasks as you. So therefore, our, the circumstances of our lives, they're tailored to create a unique set of obstacles and um, assists to help us um, overcome our obstacles and to cut back to God. The idea is that the, our mission, we have a mission, and what God, what, how good would God be if he didn't provide us the mechanism and the tools to fulfill our job? You would go to work and if you, you know, you're meant, you're meant to, uh, you know, repair cars and you don't have any tools, only your bare hands, it would be impossible to do that. God provides us the tools necessary to fulfill our function and our role. So just as a reminder from a previous class, this, this dark space, this concealment, this, um, this restriction of light, the symptom, this vacated space that's almost barely imperceivable, that there's almost nothing, no light there. It's just the after uh, the residual light. According to God's perspective, um, you know, the Zohar says this is called the lamp of darkness, which seems kind of like an oxymoron. How can a lamp commit darkness? And this, what they're saying is that this vacated space, to us, we perceive it as darkness, but it's only in respect to creation and mankind. To us, we're blind to the, the presence of God within that cave, with with I'm sorry, within that vacated space. In relation to God, it is light. God's, God's light, his essence doesn't change. Um, just because you block out the light of the sun, it doesn't change the, the attribute of the sun. You're just blocking out the light from the sun. You don't fundamentally change the nature of the sun every time you limit the light that comes into your home. And the same is true with God. Um, but this means that we have unique challenges. There are very real challenges 
that we must overcome. And, and in our world, the consequences of God's concealment means that these challenges, these uh, factors that affect us um, can come through the horrors of abuse or neglect, loss, illness, even day-to-day -day challenges. And you know, the list really can go on and on and on. Um, but it's also, um, there's also a very real reward to overcome these challenges. And we have the capacity and the mechanisms to do it. It's not easy, it's not meant to be easy. It's, it's extremely difficult. Um, but you can see this idea, it's embodied in, um, in, in, in the Talmud in Sukkot 52a. It talks about the time where it says, Rabbi Yehuda taught in the future, the Holy One, blessed be he, will bring the Yetzirah, which is the evil inclination, that urge that causes us to act contrary to God. He'll slaughter it before the righteous and the wicked. And to the righteous, it'll appear as a tall mountain. To the wicked, it appears as a ha hair's breadth. Each group cries, the righteous cry and say, how were we able to conquer the tall mountain? And the wicked cry and say, how were we unable to conquer the hair's breadth? And God also wonders with them as it says, thus the Lord of hosts, if it be wondrous in the eyes of the remnant of his people in those days, it is also wondrous in my eyes. And this is very interesting to me because the idea of um, Adonai Tzavot, um, the uh, Lord of hosts is the attribute of Netzach or conquering, overcoming. So overcoming the obstacle is possible, but it does take an alignment with God and a drawing down of his energy into our own life and a, a contraction of our own sense of self. Um, so this is, this is the end of this class and I'm gonna go back and answer a few questions. Um, we can have a discussion as well. So someone asked here, does everyone fulfill their purpose? I believe, I believe yes, I believe so. Um, there's, there's a lot of like some of the, these really deep concepts that are really hard to get into here is that there's, uh, you have a function, you have a role in God, you will be, how you get there is your choice. Where you end, that's God. <laughs> and it's hard to explain. There's a lot of ideas and concepts in between. So Francisco asked, does elevation of a spark manifest as literal sparks? was doing hands-on healing on someone and then starting to see, okay. Um, it's not, it's not um, a literal spark. It's the idea is, um, and the wrong call goes into a lot in this concept. He says, how does a phys how does a, how does a spiritual concept come into physical being? And so there is, it, it talks about this order of unfolding um, that there's an energy that sustains everything behind. It says, I, I it says behind every blade of grass is an angel a malach, or a messenger that brings it into existence and causes it to move. Um, we're fans of the matrix here. So the, the greatest, the, you know, the, the analogy of the matrix is, is absolutely like the perfect vehicle to understand Kabbalah. And so you can see that every aspect of the matrix world behind the, what you perceive as, re, as, as a person or a chair or a table is the code of the matrix that brings it into existence. And so that's kind of, uh, that's a way to understand these sparks, this energy that sustains our world. Um, it's really hard to think that this holy um, energy that traces back all the way to the light of the angel self and the infinite God can become a rock or a table, but that's how far, how concealed, how, um, constricted God's light becomes to the point where it becomes physicality in the reality of our world. So when you pick up a rock or you, 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 you eat um, an animal, it's truly you, you connecting back to the essence, the spiritual essence of that, of that being. So, you know, you can't eat gold, but you, know, you can't eat metal, but you, how you use it, you can give, you can elevate the sparks contained within the material world through charity, through, through the Zadaka, um, through, um, you know, giving an article of clothing to somebody in need. You can, you can elevate the, the, materi the, the material world as well. Um, and, and this is where, these are the concepts of how do, how do we interact with the world in a way that brings elevation and not damage? Because we see when, Adam and Eve interact with the world in a way that's contrary to God does, it brings about great damage. Um, so the, this, what the, this is what the commandments are for. The commandments reveal to us how to interact the world in a proper way to elevate the world and ourselves at the same time. So 
because we're blind because of the concealment of God, as stated before, we're blind to the spiritual reality that underlies our existence. That is the nature of concealment. And if you look, the best example of this is in the book of Esther. God's name is not even include, not mentioned once in the book of Esther, yet we know he's orchestrating all of the circumstances that lead to, you know, Esther and the Jewish people being being saved by Haman. So, Haman. so, so we can see, we know who's running the show, but it's never overtly mentioned. And that's what Hester Panim, uh, the heading of God's face within creation, to the extent that we, like you said before, that you can almost, that a person can deny that God truly even exists. Uh, sorry, it was a kind of a long answer. Are there any other questions or anybody wanna go on the, so can I explain the concepts of the sparks? Yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty, I will do the best that I can. Um, so as stated before, the idea of this, the, um, the unfolding of creation, the, 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 the reality of our world means that there has to be a separation between us and God, that um, a lot of the information, like where, when, where I'm learning from uses this idea of an interface. I faded. See here. I'm sorry, I keep getting things popping up on my computer here. Um, so, oh, okay. Oh, I answered that. Okay. And uh, do I have any other questions? I just want to thank everyone so much for hanging in there and joining the room. Um, I do have some things to post from week book from the previous class and then and some more from this one. Are there any other questions or comments? And Evelyn, thank you so much for joining us. Shalom, good night to you. Okay, I know I've been, it's been a long room, so I, again, appreciate everyone coming. Um, I'll hang around for a few more minutes. Are you answering on the sparks? Oh, I thought someone said I'd answer. So, uh, yeah, so the sparks. Uh, so, um, yeah, I can try. Here, the sound is not working. <clears throat> So going back to the sparks, the idea that this 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 energy contains the basic here, here go back take like five or six steps back. So the idea is that God's goodness in the form of these primordial vessels, God wants us to be involved within creation. We have we have to emulate God, meaning that God takes His infinite aspect of of the Orin Sof, and through a series of concealments and um, is, uh, creates our, not only the, the world in which we live, but ourselves. So to bring about the possibility of choice, to bring about the possibility, the further concealment of God's infinite aspect, meaning the differentiation of this um, unified existence, there has to be a fracturing or um, a differentiation of this of this energy. So these first vessels, these primordial vessels come into existence and through their being absolutely good and shattering, this goodness precipitates and gets lowered down into our world. Now it's reconstituted these this energy, um, the original the original energy, the original light, as someone stated before, this idea of entropy, um, comes into existence so information is lost when the when the, the vessels are shattered it's not truly lost from our perspective there's a diminishment um, and so good therefore is lowered it, it falls and therefore this is where this uh, the world of repair comes into existence so our world our role and we see that when Adam and Eve are introduced into the garden their function is to repair the world. They're here to don't eat from this tree, eat of this one, and you know, be fruitful and multiply. So they're given these, these, these simple commands. And by doing so, they're going to elevate the world and bring everything back into unification, back into harmony, back into uh, repair. We know that they don't do this because they eat of the forbidden fruit. They eat of the tree that was forbidden to them and they cause even further um, further damage and further concealment and a lowering of the world into physicality to an extent that God's essence is almost completely hidden. And this is what happens with the shattering of the primordial vessels. It creates a lowering of this energy and God himself begins to rectify and repair these vessels. And this is why the world of Tohu 
becomes the world of tikkun, the world of repair and rectification. So Adam in his role in the garden um, emulates this world of repair in how he is in, in his function in his role. And so these vessels now can, um, these sparks, this energy becomes contained within husks or clipot or shells within our world. And it sustains the dark horse physicality and it waits like a prisoner to be freed and unified back to its source. And that's what the sparks are in a really simplistic, overly simplified view. Uh, why is a sacrifice of a life a recurring pattern? Isaac, Abraham. Yeah, so this is something that I, I until very recently, really, I thought, like, I really struggled to understand myself. And the way that I have seen it taught and understand it um, is that you have, this is the, this is the elevation of, of the, um, the physical realm. There's ways, there are ways to elevate, um, the elements of our physical world, whether it be like the garments we wear, there's, there's in the Torah, it says, don't, don't combine linen and wool. Well, that's a, you know, that's the, it's kind of the, uh, the meaning and the reality of why not to do that is pretty hidden to us. There's a re reason, but there's a way to interact with the plant world that's proper. There's a way to interact with the animal world that is proper as well. One of that is by you know, there are animals that are forbidden to eat. You can, there's no way you, you don't eat them. You don't, you don't interact with them. Um, there's no way to elevate them. There are animals that can be elevated, meaning like kosher animals, but they have to be, they have to be elevated in the proper way. Um, they have to be slaughtered properly. They have to be prepared. The blood has to be dealt with properly. And um, they, in, in an even greater extent, they uh, have to, there's blessings that you said, your kavan and your intent have to be attached to them as well. And this is very true. You can see that um, that in, in the Mishkan or the tabernacle and later the temple that you see these, these this, uh, um, the elevation of all of these elements of creation coming together in the service of God, the Kohanim, the, the, the priests in their service to God, they, they elevate the material, the mineral, the animal and um, our, the human, uh, they elevate all of these things. And in regards to the elevation of the animal kingdom, you see that it's through sacrifices and offering. So there's a proper time and a proper mechanism to elevate this energy of this animal back to God. And by doing so, elevate creation as well, freeing those sparks in a very particular fashion, in a very particular way. I almost think of it as like, and I, I have no source for this, is this is how my brain works, is that it's like you have a puzzle piece it's a very unique puzzle piece and it's meant to go to a specific place, but it's say, you, you know, you, you, you open a box, your puzzle and you're going to put it together, but you know, put it fall, you open the box exuberantly and all the puzzle pieces go everywhere. So now the search is on and, you know, it'd be pretty frustrating to, you know, find only 999 pieces of a thousand piece puzzle. But that's the idea is that these sparks, there's a very particular element that is that goes into this puzzle piece and we're here to find it and elevate it and bring it back to its source and this has a, it's not an infinite it's not an infinite quest there aren't infinite number of, of of puzzle pieces there's not an infinite number of sparks the result says there's 288 sparks now is that a literal whatever that means maybe it's an allegory but these sparks are hidden within creation and there'll come a point where where um, they will all be brought back together because the vessels that shattered, even though they're supernal and they're far above us and they're far different than what we could comprehend as reality, they're still finite creations and therefore the energy is finite and buried as well. So I know I'm getting off topic. Anyway, sorry. So bring it back to the puzzle piece. When you do an offering or a sacrifice in the proper way, it uncovers that particular piece of the puzzle and brings it back to where it needs to go. That's how I understand it anyway. Any other, anything, any other questions or who else wanna? Let's see here. So we have, oh, um, we have here, we have one of the, um, here. We do have, I'm trying, I don't have the schedule of the other rooms in front of me. Um, I think the next one would be Tovia's room, if I might be right. 
uh, if, any, if you want to post it in the text, like when the next room is, what time. Um, oh yeah, uh, Diana posted a really beautiful uh, discussion about Ananias. Uh, yeah, so um, what are they? Uh, Nate Avan Abihu, why they die. Um, so next Saturday is Devakut, nine o'clock. Is it the same time, nine p.m.? Um, Nate Avan Abihu. Okay, and then that's a beautiful, beautiful uh, meditation room. Um, yeah, and and on it, I know this is like really kind of like really like out there, so Kabbalistic ideas. Um, don't be afraid to 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 um, post questions in in the group, I'll, you know, God will, like I said, I'm kind of like been swamped with school and it's kind of laid silent and, and dormant for the last few weeks, but God willing after May 7th, I'll be able to become more interactive. So please make use of the group, um, ask questions. Um, I'm gonna use a lot of the, if you, if God, you know, if you would be so kind as to leave some feedback in the room to say like, well, these are the concepts of the ideas that I didn't understand. I'd like more understanding. I really don't have a direction for after these last three rooms. So I really would appreciate the feedback to see where people would like to, like to go, where would they like to go next? Choosing limitation to be concealed. Yes, I think that that's a, that was one really deep concept that, um, and that would be a series of, of more than a few classes. Um, again, I, there's like I said, there are there are amazing um, teachers and rabbis that discuss these ideas and these concepts so much further. Um, my hope in, 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 in introducing some of these concepts, if you hadn't heard them before, is to um, post some of these ideas so you might have something to connect to. Um, and just and just realize this, like Diana says, even if it feels above your head, hang on. You know, as you as you get. Um, as you get these ideas that you, like you said, you don't understand, you put them away and, uh, and um, these, this information will come to you. So uh, thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. It's been an immense blessing to be able to talk and share. Um, appreciate your questions and your, and, and, uh, and everything. So uh, Shavua Tov everyone.